Hey there, welcome to another edition of Kung Fu Physics where we are currently working our way through practice physics GRE problems. The one I have for you this evening is number 97 off of the 1986 exam. It's a rather lengthy mechanics problem so we'll go ahead and get started into it immediately. A quick glance at the answers leaves me kind of hopeful because the answers are varied and so when I see something like that I'm hopeful that I will be able to eliminate or choose one of those answers immediately or or close to immediately so uh, without wasting any more time quick look at the diagram I would start in on the problem number 97 two uniform cylindrical disks of identical mass m radius r and moment of inertia one half m r squared as shown above collide on a frictionless horizontal surface disk one having an initial counterclockwise angular velocity omega naught and a center of mass velocity v naught equals one half omega naught r to the right makes a grazing collision with disc two initially at rest if after the collision the two discs stick together the magnitude of the total angular momentum about the point p is now this problem is solved fairly simply it's a dangerous problem it's a dangerous problem because it's so lengthy. That's one way that the problem is dangerous. Um, right off the bat, you've already invested more time on this problem than you would other problems, just because you're reading that big block of text. So it is a kind of a, a dangerous problem. It's not super hard, but, but this is how you would do it um, quickly enough on the physics GRE. This is how I do it in my head. Hopefully it makes sense to you as well. The angular momentum initially, right before the collision, is going to be equal to the final angular momentum of the two disks after the collision. And that's what's asked for. I'm using L to represent the total angular momentum of both disks about point P. Total angular momentum of both disks about point P. Now. When I look at the initial situation, the important thing to realize is that disk one is providing angular momentum into the situation in two ways. One is its, its rotation about its own center of axis. So that's number one. Disk one is rotating about its axis. Now the other way that disk one is providing angular momentum about point P is that disk one has a transverse velocity and it is perpendicular to the lever arm okay I should probably be more careful in that second statement. I'm a little concerned about that. Um, <laughs> I'm not a physics professor and I, after doing these videos I have much respect for physics professors because they have to be very careful with their words and I'm constantly trying to catch myself and making many many retakes because I say something simple. I mess up something simple like saying angular velocity instead of angular momentum or something like that. You do have to be careful with your words and, and I'm a little concerned about this, but hopefully you understand what I mean by that. When something has a transverse velocity um, and you draw a line from the point in question, in this, in this case point P, out to that, and it's got a tangential velocity to that, then it is providing angular momentum around that point. So what's important, the way to solve this problem is realizing that those are both adding in 
angular momentum. And so the initial angular momentum is going to equal that angular momentum one plus angular momentum two that is caused by both of those things. So L1, looking at that, L1 is just going to be caused by the disc rotating. Okay, so this is disc one. It's rotating in this direction at omega naught. And it's very simply just I times omega naught. They give us I, which is one half MR squared, right? times omega naught. And so you should be careful about this because of course angular momentum is a vector quantity. So this dude L1 is either going into or out of the page, right? I get a little sloppy at that case. And for me, actually doing a physics GRE problem like this, as all this stuff is whizzing through my head as I'm trying to solve the problem fast, for me, it's easier for me to just think of this angular momentum as going counterclockwise. So this is kind of a shortcut that I take in my head. I know that that thing is going into or out of the page and whatnot, but for me, I say L1 is going counterclockwise. L2. Now L2, this is what's happening as that disk, which you can think of as being smaller than it actually is. You can think of it as almost being a point mass at that point. Its total mass is m. It's got a momentum. And its momentum is m times its transverse velocity. And this disk where the center of mass is at, it's going to stick. Here is point p. And it's going to stick. So I know that looks a little different than the actual situation shrinking down the disk and thinking of it more as a point mass but that is in effect what's going on now because it is shrunk down the center of mass is actually located at distance r the radius hopefully you can see that looking at the problem that if you shrink it down it's located at a distance of r so in this case l2 we go to our other angular momentum formula, and that is it's r cross p. Hopefully you remember that. We don't have to sweat the cross because everything is 90 degrees right before it impacts. Everything is lined up very nicely, so it's 90 degrees, so we're just multiplying. Our r is big R, and then our momentum is the mass of the disk times its transverse velocity, which they give us as one half omega naught r. And you can just jiggle that around a little and you get the same thing. L2 equals one half m r squared omega naught. Which direction is that angular momentum acting in? Look at the, the problem, and you can see where the velocity is going to the right. And as the two disks stick, that velocity is going to the right. It's going to tend to torque it in a clockwise velocity. Excuse me, in a clockwise um, rotation. Okay, so you've got one half m r squared omega naught angular momentum acting counterclockwise and you have one half m r squared omega naught angular momentum acting clockwise. What this leads me to believe is that L1 plus L2 equals zero. Those two cancel out. And so my initial angular momentum is equal to zero. I can add in the other disk and my final angular momentum must also be zero because disk two is providing no angular momentum about point P whatsoever. All of it would be potentially in, in disk one. And, and I've shown that those two cancel out. So the angular momentum, the final angular momentum is zero and there is no rotation for the two disks. So that's the solution, the way that I see it.
And I know there are many other ways to solve these problems. Maybe you have seen the solution a little different. That's all fine and good, but that's the way I see the solution to number 97 off of the 1986 exam. Now, if that helps you and you're done, hopefully you can close up this window, move on to another video or something like that. Um, if not, I do have a small commentary about these two types of angular momentum that I've just been thinking about and I think they're of interest. So if you want, I'll probably take four or five minutes to go over those at this point. And I think this problem illustrates very nicely how there are two ways that you can impart angular momentum to something. Um, and, and one is by absorbing something into your into the system, into your mass that already has angular momentum. And so we'll start with this first way. What I want you to imagine is say I am on ice skates and I'm standing on a frictionless surface. I'm standing on ice that is frictionless. So if you impart an angular momentum to me, I will rotate, right? So the first way that you might think of doing that is to use a Frisbee. Now, this may be a lame example. It probably is a lame example, but I haven't been able to think of a better one. So say you have a Frisbee disc and you're not gonna throw the Frisbee disc to me. You're going to spin it. And let's just say, for the sake of this example, you have some way of levitating it there, spinning in thin air. And the way I'm going to try and get angular momentum out of it is by grabbing it with my hands. So I put my hands above and below this spinning frisbee like this, and I snap it and, and grab it really quick like that and stop its, angular, its rotation. I stop its rotation very quickly. Can you imagine what's gonna happen to me? That stuff had angular momentum. There was an initial angular momentum in the frisbee disc. So now the system consists of me and the frisbee disc. Do we still have angular momentum? We should because angular momentum is conserved. So at that point, whichever direction the frisbee is rotating, if it's rotating like this and I catch it, I should start to rotate like that as well. Very slowly because my mass will be greater, my moment of inertia will be greater. But that is one way that you can absorb an angular momentum. What I find really weird about that way, and correct me if I'm wrong, by all, by all means, people are always free to comment on these videos and I welcome them, but it doesn't matter exactly where I put my hands and grab that Frisbee. It doesn't matter if my hands are outstretched and I grab it or if they're right next to me and I grab the Frisbee or if the Frisbee spinning on top of my head and I snap the Frisbee between my hand and head like that. If I stop the Frisbee, if I stop all of its rotation, it should impart all of its angular momentum and it should be the exact same. I will get the same rotation out of me and the Frisbee afterwards as before in, in any of those cases. In any of those cases, I will take all of the angular momentum away from the Frisbee and add it to myself and the Frisbee. So uh, I think that's very unusual that you can uh, add that angular momentum at any point. Very different than the second way that you can add angular momentum. And that is when you uh, use a transverse velocity that's acting at a lever arm off of your, your uh, center of mass. And again, I'm a little rusty, forgive me. If some of my terms are a little off, hopefully they're not that far off. But in a practical physical situation, again, imagine me on the ice, rather than giving me a Frisbee that's rotating, imagine you are throwing me a tennis ball that for all intents and purposes is a point mass. And so I think we're pretty comfortable intuitively if I hold my hand out and you fire a tennis ball in at my hand, I grab it, I'm going to start rotating. That tennis ball is going to impart a angular momentum. It will cause a rotation. It will also call it, cause a transverse velocity as well because transverse momentum is conserved. But it will impart angular momentum on me. At this point, it is critical to know how far my handout is extended out. 
If I'm stretching my hand out as far as it can go and that tennis ball hits, it's going to impart the maximum angular momentum at that point. If I pull my arm in a little to where it's halfway, I will not get as much angular momentum from that. If you fire the tennis ball right at my center of mass and I catch it, I will get zero angular momentum. I'll have no rotation because it's acting right on that center of mass point. There's no lever arm to speak of. And so I would get only transverse velocity from that and no angular momentum. My point here that I think is interesting is the contrast between those two things. In the second situation where you have a transverse velocity and an object that's being absorbed like that, the lever arm and where that object is attached and absorbed is incredibly important but in the first case not so much you're just taking the angular momentum adding it in and I just think that was a uh, sort of an interesting interesting thing to think about I guess before I did this problem I had never really thought about those two ways that you can impart an angular momentum to another system of objects so Hopefully that's helpful to you if this problem was a little confusing and hopefully you weren't incredibly bored by it or uh, anything like that if you were not confused at all by this problem. So as always, I advise you study very hard for the physics GRE uh, and I'll catch you next time.